I'm gonna come sit next to you. All right, here, you might as well get in the middle. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kimai Cutler, um, and I'm a long, I, I'm, I work in a venture capital in the Bay Area, and I was a longtime journalist before that for about 10 years. Um, so today's panel, we've consumed a lot of different ideas for how the system can work differently, but this panel today is about taking those ideas and translating them into concrete um, actions, like a, 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 like different policies or different, different ways that we can organize people to change the system around us. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves, give a little bit of your background, try to keep it not too long because we'll dive into the details a little bit more later. <laughs> Um, do you want to start, Paul? Yes. Um, I've been educated as an economist and then turned into a politician, which is even a harder business to do than economics. <laughs> and I've been in national parliament and uh, the last five years in uh, the European parliament. And we have elections, European elections coming on uh, May 23. Hi, everybody. Um, again, I'm Tawana Petty. I am a director of data justice programming for Detroit Community Technology Project, as well as a member of Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and a board member of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership. Hey everybody, uh, my name is James and Felton and Keith. I have too many first names, but most people just call me JFK. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's, I didn't pick it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess these days I'm a politician. I'm, I'm running for, for U.S. Congress in uh, New York's 13th District. And um, I'm the president of the data union here in the United States. We have multiple data unions. And um, uh, over the years, I've been an entrepreneur. I've founded companies in insure tech and fintech and ad tech, uh, a few nonprofits, including the LGBT Chamber of Commerce here in Detroit. And I'm um, formally trained just uh, as an engineer and economist, though. Mm -hmm. so, so let's start yeah. with a question here. I mean, so the sense I get from some of you, like this isn't something that you, I mean, Paul, you weren't elected to parliament on, on data rights as a particular issue, but many of you had a personal journey that mm -hmm. led you to a point where you become more politically active on the issue. And so I'm wondering um, maybe we don't want to, if either want, you want to jump in, like, what was the aha moment that made you say, I'm going to write a piece of legislation about this or I'm going to start an organization around it? Uh, for me, I just thought you were going to go with that. Okay, uh, no, 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 just. Uh, well, Paul and I have been talking, well, all three of us have been talking uh, throughout the conference, and it's been great, by the way. Uh, everyone in here is an interesting rock star. I'll just say really briefly, I usually just come to conferences about 30 minutes before and after the, <laughs> the talk. And I've, you know, been deep in this one the, the whole weekend. But uh, I think, I don't know, being from Detroit, being rigidly who I am from Detroit, what made me move into this space and this type of policy is I'm really trying to facilitate inclusion, right? And data is the most micro resource that I can assign myself ownership of and then indemnify myself for contributing it as, <clears throat> as an input to productivity. And so my work has always been around that. It's always been around inclusion. Uh, it's always been around acknowledging my diverse identity. And it just so happens that I'm of the right age where we're living in a time where we can actually quantify what my identity is and I can distribute back to not only myself, but everyone else, um, their piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that they're contributing. And so the policy is a derivative of that. The institutions are a derivative of that. And the conversations that we have politically are, are also just a, a derivative of that. Yeah. So I, I never thought I'd be sandwiched between two politicians. Uh, <laughs> okay. Is it frightening you? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Um, but so I'd like to, um, like I said, I'm a director of data justice programming. Uh, for Detroit Community Technology Project. I'm also a data justice researcher. And so I like to bring some community members' voices into the space, uh, Detroiters, Charlotte and LA. Um, I co-led a three city participatory research project called Our Data Bodies Project. And we recently released a digital defense playbook. 
And so, um, but I want to important, most importantly, bring some voices into the room because a lot of times the way we think of data is very, um, it's trying to figure out how to monetize it, but there are folks that are suffering because of the use of their data. And so as an example, um, one of the uh, Detroiters that we interviewed uh, said, I would love to, to un-Google my life. Like essentially they don't know their life outside of Google. Mm. Um, as an, an, an example, it's out there. Once it's out there, it's out there. You can't take it back. So folks are feeling, no, I'm not feeling all that secure. Some of the way I'm feeling is because I don't fully understand the technology. And I could go on and on and on. And so my work um, as part of Detroit Community Technology Project is to demystify data, but also um, educate community members on the impact of their data, how they can retrieve some of that data back, and what are some ways that they can exercise more autonomy over the information that they give out. Um, on a daily basis. What, what's that education or organizing process like? Are people coming to you mm -hmm. with, you know, pre-existing concerns or is there a process where you talk through the experience and they become more aware of how their data is being used? And Most people come with pre-existing concerns. They've, they've suffered under the impact of how their data has been used in their communities. Um, they suffered under the impact of how their data has been leveraged against them so that they um, have been unable to get a job or, um, or you know, thrive within their communities. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and as an example, um, someone mentioned earlier the open data portal, I believe, and there's over 2,600 in the country and most people don't even know it exists. So city governments have open data, open data portals where they're putting a bunch of data in there and community members don't even know what's in there. They don't know what's extracted about them. They don't know how those portals are being used for speculation in their neighborhoods and a bunch of other things. The, uh, public safety is looked at more so as militarization and surveillance mm -hmm. instead of like, where is the resource center where I can get water or food or aid? And so I think there's a disconnect be between the psychology of how like, no offense y'all, because mm -hmm. y'all are on the other side, no, but right. government yeah. officials are looking at data and the use of data and how commun community members are experiencing that mm -hmm. data and mm -hmm. that use of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need you can in the, I, uh, New York. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> now, can I just, it. because uh, to answer your question, I, I, I one of the, uh, <laughs> let's say the politician that had a growing awareness, mm -hmm. uh, when you think about it, we had uh, the merger of uh, Facebook with uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, and there was no uproar about yeah. this. So it was 2012, 2014. Mm -hmm. But you see the growing concentration of money and power. Yeah. Because if you now look at what are the largest companies in the world mm -hmm. uh, on the stock exchange, it's the, big, the frightful five, the big five. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, caught attention. And uh, at the same time, you see you're in the European Union work that has been done on let's say, regulating uh, data, the GDPR is, is one of the main, main examples, but these are slow processes. So I, for myself, I've been a growing awareness that you see the concentration of money and powers, which frightens me, uh, but it's also a bit from my uh, political background, I'm a social democrat, so the concentration of money and power is sort of, that's been our, uh, our fight throughout uh, in, our, in our tradition. Yeah. But also on a personal level, uh, my youngest is 14, um, we have the PlayStation in the living room so we can see what kinds of games he plays, but I don't know what he sees on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So this is the, talking about communities, just mm -hmm. when I yeah. talk with parents on, uh, with this, we don't know what they are offered. Mm -hmm. You would like to see what television programs they look like, sure. uh, look, uh, they want to see what games they play, but I don't know what they see, uh, see on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I still like to think that as a parent, I have, um, uh, could have a beneficial impact on, the, on their uh, upbringing. Um, if there was an aha moment, it was when I had uh, when I read about uh, data as labor, mm -hmm. and not just because it's the concept which is interesting, and it has been discussed in this conference also, um, but the idea that you have a data union which empowers people, yeah. because a lot of people feel it's let's say the big data and the big uh, tech giants are too big; they feel powerless. Mm -hmm. And for me, the data union was a, a moment that I thought, oh. Now we, we can bring people together and let them 
come into action. And in this effect, we initiated a data union in the Netherlands in uh, May, uh, May last year. And indeed, people come from all places. Some people are tax savvy, they know everything already. But some people are just concerned and want to learn more. But they come together and start working on data in healthcare, data in education. And uh, uh, we use also the GDPR to write to companies, say, what do you do with the data? You don't comply with the GDPR, please. And we give you six weeks to comply. Uh, so really, and this, the good thing is that you empower people to do something. It's not something big and abstract, which you can't do anything about. Now you can come into action. Can you, so two of you are working on the data union. What, what is it? How do you define it? How does it work? Who participates? Yeah, well, uh, so we define ours as, uh, also I should say, we, we had some side talks and yeah. it'd be ideal to really have a, a, a global federation of these of these unions with concerted efforts that are <clears throat> specific to the different geographic locale, you know, per what they need. Uh, Europeans, you know, legislate more, we litigate more. Uh, so, but specific to our data union, it was born out of a trade association. There was really a makeup of memberships from uh, insurance companies and technology companies that were looking at personal data as an asset class, per how it was coined at the World Economic Forum. I'm an organizer of sorts, but I'm a business process organizer. My background is, uh, in, until I was an entrepreneur, was really in what we call corporate ethnography, corporate change management. So we took the regular consulting train-the-trainer framework, and we built it into a data union so that we can advise the unions that want to organize around data rights of sorts. So most organized labor here in the United States and Europe, they're uh, negotiating for wages, which in the 21st century is, is a necessary negotiation, but it's not the whole pie anymore. A wage we should look at as, um, as a retainer for your time, right? But So we teach them via our train to trainer methodology how to negotiate for incomes above the wages because both employee and consumer data is the input to economic productivity. And not just at the big tech firms, but at every company, every small law firm, every mom and pop, you know, bodega, you name it. So we look at organized labor because that's institutional infrastructure that's already there. And we find those organized and figureheads to help empower. But we also look at non-union groups, like groups of parents who are concerned because they've both got their genome sequence. And now you don't need to ever you know, sequence your kids' genomes because that data is out there. And it's being transacted via those institutions that collect it, via pharmaceutical benefits managers. And this is not the ad tech media industry that we normally talk about. But in fact, the biggest personal data brokers out there are in healthcare. And so anyway, we work with different factions of loosely organized and well-organized groups to unionize how they negotiate for indemnification. So I'm talking about income, not wages. So that, I mean, that's how we're organized. We're a not-for-profit institution that deploys organizers to organize the organizers. So in, in training all these organizers, what are the commonalities that you see in their particular struggles and how is that different from other types of labor organizing? So everyone's a subject matter expert, right? Like specific to their industry. The, the only commonality is they want from us and the sort of the, the work and the talent comes into place is us having to be really business strategists and pivot per whatever their new unique demands are to say, this is how you want to litigate. I'm always like, let's litigate, let's sue first. Who can I sue? I'm American, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is another key oh, point that's kind sue. of interesting that the difference yeah. between the American strategy and the European strategy. Exactly. The American it's, strategy is gonna be much I'm always gonna, gonna sue litigious. you first, right? I'm gonna yeah. sweep kick you and see if we can get into a fight first. And through the discovery process of that fight, when I rip your jacket and realize, you know, your shirt sleeve is dirty, then we have to start talking about that, you know, that sleeve. <laughs> but I have to rip your jacket first. Anyway, through a legal process. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's that Detroit company. That's the Detroit, right? I'm still that guy. I just, I have to get dressed up every day. But <laughs> so, so I think the, the, the play there is the commonality that we see to, to answer your question is they usually only need to know um, what are we suing for and what are the economics of that case? Like uh, I, I had a guy named John Samuelson. He's the uh, international president for the Transportation Workers Union. 
And he's he's like, I got 30,000 guys at American Airlines in DC. And I know they just turned the Wi-Fi on for all of us for free. I think they're selling data. I don't know how. I don't have a number to negotiate with them above wages. So I run a conference called Personal Data Week. I invited in the former chief privacy officer for WPP, which if you're not familiar, is the largest advertising company on the planet, and the CIO at Barney's New York. Now, WPP can confirm that they'll buy a record on you for $15. And to be clear, a record are any two things about you, your name and your email address. Now, their business cycle is Barney's will pay 50 cents per amendment to WPP every time they can expand your record. So if they have your name, and your home address, they'd like your email address so they can you know, send you ads and know you when you walk in the store, you name it. And so as they endeavor to do that, now John at the TWU has a story to tell in front of the board at American. And he also has some numbers that he can extrapolate across 30,000 people to say, we don't want a one-off payment. We're not looking for a class action suit, which is the real difference between the Europeans and Americans and why we sue. Uh, we get to sue in class action suits, but we don't want a simple class action settlement. I don't want one big number. I want a piece of that transaction every time that happens. And even while privacy and dignity and everything that Tristan talked about earlier and Boots Rally is in play, we need a moral ethic for how we get along in society. We also have to control the incentives for capital flows. And this is capital now. And as a guy from Detroit who has been strategically undervalued over time, even though I'm doing decent, I want all my money. I want all of it. So how's your this, data this, again? This, this, it's a bit different. Uh, yeah. James and I compared notes last time, and yeah. there was a clear difference yeah. between America and Europe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what we try to do is to to organize people, that, and I think that's I think that's the same. So we bring on political organizers, people that are experienced in organizing. Well, let's say with the nerds, which who are not used to getting organized, so to say, uh, which is a very interesting combination. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes it's struggling, but in the end we in the end we get there. Uh, what we try to do is just to find uh, to target companies, yeah. say, give them, um, uh, tell them what they do wrong, and we have the already legal backing from the GDPR and tell them what to, they need to do and I give them time to do it. So this what, is, what, what which do is, they typically need to do to exercise those oh, rights? For example, they still implement tracking cookies. Uh, so th they are not allowed by GDPR unless they have given consent. They, do the, they still do it and we say, okay, this is not to be done. So this is fairly simple. But mm -hmm. what we also do, and this is a bit more European style, we have an, uh, um, a privacy agency mm -hmm. that where you can file as individual as a complaint and it's taken up. And in fact, they do it for the day for, they have a load of work since the introduction of the GDPR, but they, they still try to do it. Uh, but they are very happy when, when it comes to collective uh, complaint from the, da the data union because they can give priority to that. So yeah. here you see the interaction between the, the formal institutions and the more informal institutions that, um, uh, and that, that gives, us also, uh, gives us also leverage we're not, we're not hooked up to the traditional trade unions because they are gray and too traditional, I must they say. Are in gray and so yeah. average, uh, average membership is about yeah. uh, is it, 55 is or so. The, the one, one other yeah. thing what we try to do is because we are a trade union in the end of the day, we want to be able to strike. So we develop technical tools to strike. Okay, we don't yeah. give you the data. Sorry, not today. How, how does and, that work? Uh, well, it's, not, it's technically yeah. not that difficult, by the way. Um, but it's at, at this stage all a, a bit more symbolic. But I'm a politician, and I understand the power of uh, of symbolism. It is so we're yeah. looking for a good moment to get uh, to to organize a strike in the Netherlands, and then the tool is made so that you can see who uh, who is participating or how many people are participating in the strike. So that's the symbolism that you you feel that you're not alone, that you protest uh, 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 not just on your own, but with with a group of people. So that's uh, that's to be to be held uh, soon, and then. And an appropriate moment. So Can I just kind of hearing the difference here is maybe you're using litigation to set new kinds of forms of precedent, and then you're using a, you're thinking about a data union in terms of enforcing the existing laws that are already on. We are a data yeah. union, so so we have the yeah. discussion here today, and it's about monetizing data. And to um, well, I'm an economist. I don't think money is everything. Sorry. Uh, I, yeah. So no, that's not <laughs> for me. Dignity is also that you mm -hmm. take that you empower people to make uh, to make choices. So what. 
our line is, okay, we work for Google and Facebook. We do that usually very happily. Uh, but we want to discuss our labor conditions. Mm -hmm. So we are more focused less on the monetizing of data, but yeah. less more on the labor conditions. Because ever since the GDPR took place, people have huge privacy statements. What do they do with the data? So And you just give consent because no one is going to read the statements. Right. Um, and we all feel when we click yes, uh, ought, because we know it. We should read it. So what we do as a collective is say, no, we want to bargain about this. Uh, well, what is in the privacy statement? What do you do with the data? And can we also have more options? Because why is it uh, I can say yes or no? Why can I not choose more uh, on uh, on how to how my data are used? So this is what we are fighting for. So it's not about monetizing per se. It's more about the labor conditions. I'll say just really quick, I think. That, that's a really uh, important point. And, and two things. These are also very, you know, fledgling organizations. We're growing and like, we'd love to do more data strikes yeah. as well. I think one thing we've been talking with Glenn about are using VPNs to, while we may not shut down pieces of the internet, it is important per Paul's statement to show how many people care about it. But um, uh, beyond that, per uh, something you just mentioned about being able to negotiate for labor conditions because now it's a data issue and it's not just about consumer data alone or employee data alone but uh every firm of of sophistication is starting to surveil their employees to the nines That's and <clears throat> those contracts that we opt into and this is again another difference between the litigation in the, in the united states is a lot of those take it or leave it contracts that we opt in because Everything is still the same with all those information providers, but now we've opted in. So now they're like, okay, so we have consent. We have consent to rape you now. I'll be aggressive with this language because that's really how it is. We would still call those in the United States, and is where the lawyers come into play, contracts of adhesion. So if there is not adequate, and this is where unions like PAWS or all of ours come into play, if there isn't adequate negotiation around what options are in that document that you're consenting to, then in the United States, it's still flexible to be argued. And that's why when people are like, well, we already opted in, we already gave all our data, it's over. It's like, no, it's never over here. We're always available to have another fight. We'll find the, the smallest nitpicky thing. And in this case, it always ties back to autonomy, dignity, you name it. <clears throat> and because it ties back to those very basic human things. Um, we always have an argument to argue for another piece of the pie, a more dignified piece of the pie, et cetera. And so, you know, data is fastly becoming, you know, everything. So what we really need is, is a Tawana everywhere now. We need like 200 of you. So now we need yeah, drones. So, yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. So, so we, we have a pretty tremendous, uh, um, contentious, contradictory, loving, uh, relationship. <laughs> my name is his mom's name, and my grandfather's name is Felton. So, Bam, there we go. <laughs> but, but, and we're Detroiters, no matter whether you call yeah. somewhere else or not. I'm but I, I, honestly, I'm somewhere. I'm, I'm like stuck in the middle of this because I still want to push these organizations to collect the bare minimal um, from us. And I think, I yeah, think yeah, we kind of rolled up, over, um, mm -hmm. even, even if. And I, I commend them for creating these data unions, honestly, but I think that the power is in the populace. And I think that we have a, a since we're in a privileged position mm -hmm. to be exposed to this information, we have a, a responsibility to educate community members mm -hmm. on what they can uh, opt out of mm -hmm. and which organizations they can push back against. On a very small scale, when you go to the store and they ask you for your email address before they ring up your order, mm -hmm. say no. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. We, we've gotten to the point where we don't even say no to that, you know? And so I think it's, we've just gotten into this uh, mindset of that, well, they have to have it in order for me to do this thing, which is forced consent. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities for us to push <clears throat> back on the request that... Um, that organizations, corporations, you name it, are asking of us. And we're trying to implement it within our own practices. Mm -hmm. And like, what do we collect from people, mm -hmm. even as a social justice organization? Mm -hmm. What are we collecting that we don't need? And how can we minimize our complicit, complicity, mm -hmm. complicit, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, um, in this data extractive 
capitalistic yeah. society. I want to say one yeah. more thing because yeah. I let them talk for a long you time. You did. Let us go. Right now. <laughs> is that because I was actively listening? <laughs> um, but I want to say another thing is like it's really important. So one of the things that we do is called data disco text, and it's a play on words, short for discovering technology. Oh, and it's these right. community fairs that we do in the different districts to bring community members into the fold of what's happening in the community, whether it be what's happening with the upcoming census, mm -hmm. um, what's happening around open data, what's on the open data, how can you leverage the open data, how do you want, what do you want to withdraw from the open data. We've made equitable recommendations to the city and been in constant conversation with the CIO and the new director of digital inclusion because, I, you know, I'm one of those radicals who always felt like I didn't want to be in communication with city government, but I understand that they're making decisions that impact my community. So I have to be in communication with city government. And so um, so we're having we we bring them to our discotheques. We have them sit at stations and we have them communicate with residents about what they're doing with our data. How can sure. community members opt out of um, that data usage and how can we organize against some of this extraction? And I must say, can I, can I add to this? Because I see in, in Europe there are municipalities mm -hmm. like Barcelona and Amsterdam mm -hmm. that are very active in this area, setting mm -hmm. the standards on how to deal with data. So they promote the idea of open but controlled data sharing mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in the first place, but also run into in Amsterdam into an initiative that is looking into a, a sort of collective case of a territorial claim on our data. We want our data back. So yeah, you see, but, it, but it's interesting too, yeah. to see that the municipality mm -hmm. take a sort of activist role in this world. And that's partly because I must say that legislation is also mm -hmm. way behind, right? So you, yeah. you, you need some uh, local or regional initiatives to, uh, to, to, to find back. So that's you were telling answer. me earlier, so earlier I asked you, I mean, what's on your mind these days? And you mentioned that you mentioned something called Project Greenlight. Um, you want to speak a little bit about that? Because I'm curious about that, that process and the strategy. People are coming to you with pre-existing concerns, experiences. Mm -hmm. What do you help them do next? Yeah, so I, I have the um, unfortunate, fortunate and unfortunate um, opportunity to live in a city that has, I'm going to get to my point here. <laughs> I want to say, I wanted to say unfortunate, but I'm very careful to say unfortunate when it comes to Detroit, okay? Mm -hmm because I love my city and it birthed me and created me. But I have the unfortunate responsibility and opportunity to live in a city that has suffered under an essentially a half century of propaganda assault. So every media, music, or uh, any kind of mechanism that could put out a story against Detroit has been one particular way for almost 50 years. Because of that, the, psycho the psychological impact that that has had on community members has been buying into the fact that we are all criminals, okay? Mm -hmm. Even the ones who don't believe they're criminals mm -hmm. and know they're not criminals have bought into technologies that further criminalize them. Mm -hmm. So Project Greenlight is a surveillance system that is cameras and green flashing lights all throughout impoverished neighborhoods within Detroit that is a direct feed to the police department. It's a public-private partnership with the police department and city government and guardian alarm company and whoever else wants to dip their hands into surveillance and data extraction. Mm -hmm. And it's um, been expanded recently to over 500 businesses that are forced to pay into it, number one, because once you've convinced the community that, you're, that the, establishment, the only establishments that are safe are the ones with the cameras and the green lights, then that's where everybody's gonna go. So even if you don't wanna be a business that's part of that system, if you wanna survive, you're gonna opt in, right? And you're gonna pay all those fees. In addition to that, um, there's this 1,000 uh, surveillance traffic lights that they're gonna put cameras on all throughout the city. And so community members who don't feel safe because every time they turn on the, the, the news, even though crime has drastically, drastically decreased, the media has been proven, upticks the representation of crime over 20%. Mm -hmm. So they represent it more because it's a trillion dollar business. They wanna build a new jail. They gotta convince people there are more criminals out there than actually exist. Mm 
And so you have this constant bombardment of media that creates a psychology where community members are opting into systems that criminalize them. And so part of our responsibility is to educate our community so they can make an informed decision around how they're engaging with these systems. There's very little resistance to the extractive surveillance that's happening in Detroit right now, not just by Detroiters, but by the world. The whole world wants Detroit watched mm -hmm. and, and managed and controlled mm -hmm. for their own personal benefit. Mm -hmm. And that is harmful and violent. And my responsibility as a black woman, as a black Detroiter, who is in a city who is often in spaces to represent 800,000 other black people is to say, stop. Stop it. Um, we are here. We have been here. We, we were created as a black city um, by force. And then we held on to it <laughs> by force with little investment, lots of extraction, mm -hmm. lots of abandonment, lots of horrible media mm -hmm. and violent projections. And now that we're like, hey, hold on while y'all running in here with all your blank slate ideology and your Detroit is coming back slash make America great again. Because even progressives who come to the city and say things like Detroit is coming back, I hear and I feel make America great again. So it's the same thing. Where is it coming back from and where is it going? So this is happening. What do you, your community members, what, what's the avenue or the, what are the leverage points? Is it going to the mayor's office? Is it the police commission? Is it something else? Like, It's all of them. Uh -huh. Police commission meetings, city council meetings, calling the CIO and a um, digital inclusion manager to our digital justice coalition meetings, having community engagement events, data disco text, producing zines, you name it. We do every single thing. We uh, A magazine that I co-put co out called Riverwise Magazine that, and I brought a bunch, I don't have enough for everybody, but I brought enough for you to take a true narrative of Detroit back home with you and become a co-liberator in this struggle for our humanity. Because I think allyship has killed us. It's, it's this pet project, jump in, throw my dollars and my, you know, my savior toot and then go about my business. But um, co-liberation means that you understand that your liberation is tied up with my liberation. And when you understand that, you don't make harmful, extractive, violent decisions mm -hmm. for other human beings. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> so that, I do want to give time for audience questions, but I wanted to jump to a higher level question, which is, I mean, in, in an ideal world, what is that um, consumer user relationship with a platform or constituent relationship with the government around data use? What, what is included in that? If there's like a bill of rights around that, what are the principles that underpin such a, would underpin such a, such a, such a document or? I think it's definitely a bill of rights um, because it would be, again, we, storytelling is so important from a political standpoint and we've, I mean, Tawana just uh, displayed. <laughs> Anyway, I was feeling it. Uh, she, I mean, she just displayed well how how storytelling can can drive not only perception but but commerce and and regulatory bodies and and governance uh, in general. Um, and so, a bill of rights is not uh, a piece of legislation, but it is an important rhetorical tool for everyone to understand. Here are the basic human rights that we have to have. <clears throat> I would. Uh, before I say what I think the data bill of rights should be, I should say, I don't know if y'all are already doing this, but, but Beth and the CIO's yeah. office has to be responsible for the Greenlight Project because if they're not, then there's no one to be accountable when tragedy happens, right? right? Uh, especially Beth with this census coming up. No, us. she's great, I love yeah. Beth. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. I, so I just want to say that really quick. Mm -hmm. um, she's the CIO here in the city, <clears throat> if you all aren't familiar, but, um, with regards to a bill of rights, I mean, it has to be sort of the the core tripod of the GDPR first, the, the right to erasure, which is like the right to be forgotten, the right to portability, which is the right to dictate where your stuff should go, the right to restrictive processing, which is the right to restrict how anyone uses your natural resource and data is above labor, above the new oil above asset class, above whatever you all are calling it, a natural resource that is naturally occurring. People should also have the right to education, right. 
And this stuff should be funded, which is what I mean why we need probably not 200 Tawans, but 200,000 moving around the country and the world doing it. Uh, okay. They should also have the right to redress, which is the right to um, an adequate settlement, which goes back to me wanting to sue everybody. And you can paint me as that guy. I will sue you. Um, and the last but most important piece is the right to ownership. We should have an understanding that we own something. I think it's very important, uh, and I know that we talk about data in a lot of different ways because data is everything. Data is not the new oil, or let's call water the new oil. Data is the new matter. Data is everything that matters in space and time. And we should think about the value that it creates like that of energy. Um, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can change form value and the friction from data moving cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change form. Right now, it's in the form of too few hands that don't know what to do with it. Not that any one of us can ever be bright enough to know well what to do with anything, and so we must use it in caucus. So we have to melt some of the value that's trapped in not only these huge companies, but these huge governmental and municipal bodies so that we can all not only leverage data for its value, because its real value is in caucus so that we can also fight back and protect ourselves when we recognize that the data shows how much against each other we are because right. it will also do that yeah on fighting back because that's the in a sense the big fight mm -hmm. it's not just that we have need to have the principles and i think you formulate them uh, very well mm -hmm. but we also have the means to um, to have the counter failing power to have the deconcentration of money and power yeah what deeply concerns me that I see that uh, the education of my youngest, that uh, the impact on media through face, uh, fake news, mm -hmm. that the addiction among young are all processing data by commercial enterprises. So it's, it's completely commercialized. Yeah. And then where I come from, this is a public matter. Yeah. We think about what we teach at our schools. Yeah. We think about how to make sure that the media are diverse and diverse and independent. Mm -hmm. We think about what to do against addiction. Uh, so we also need to counterbalance uh, uh, the powers that we have now. And this is the structural change that we need. And this is the fight we are uh, uh, up against. We have to do that in the coming five years. There's discussion, for example, and I also saw Elizabeth Warren taking that point, but the European Parliament has already said we need to split the, the, the tech giants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it's a political statement, like but I'm not so sure that that will be enough because what you really need to think about, what do we want in commercial hands and what is ours, what is public? Mm -hmm. And this is what I don't, I don't yet see, and this is, uh, but this is crucial uh, to make the changes uh, that we want. It means if it... The least it means is effective ownership. Yeah. So we have to have control of our data, but not at an individual level because that's undoable. So you need representatives. That's where the trade unions, the data unions come in. There can be representatives. There should be more, uh, more than one uh, data union in my mind. So you choose your representative on how you uh, share your data. Uh, for example, but you need to get control, effective ownership of your data. But even that is not enough. And I think that point was also made very clear by Tristan Harris yeah, yesterday, yeah, did, yeah, that we right. have to think, how do we direct technology so that the data, we don't work to, uh, to produce data, but the data work for us. Uh, can I have an ask? I have an ask that everyone in all of your work, whether you have to adopt it in a different way or not, Adopt digital justice principles, adopt equitable internet initiative principles. Both can be found um, at DetroitCommunityTech.org. Take them and make them work for your community. You're right. You mentioned principles. Tristan mentioned principles. You've mentioned pr principles. And we did a lot of work with community organizations and community members. D Detroit Digital Justice Coalition is 10 years old in December. We did a lot of work to develop principles to try I, okay, and be so, more I, I'm, equitable. I'm not going to be a bit... Um, I'm, I, fine principles are fine, but they will be trampled by commercial uh, incentives. Mm -hmm. So they, we need a structural change. You, you, need, it, you will it, be fighting the, the, the sea of, of commercial But if you create interest, a new structure need, without so, principles and values, no, no, you're going to replicate the structure sure. that you But you need, to, you need to about in structural the first place. It's about the power balance. <laughs> Don't be na let's not be naive, it's about the power balance here. And what I see is huge companies with enormous uh, amount of money and therefore mm -hmm. power. They have mm -hmm. power directly in, uh, in, um, in, for example, American politics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
also partly in European politics through lobbying, but also in very, very many other ways. They only have so, power and, because we haven't realized our power yet. There's way many more of us that want to do right than those folks. And we just have to leverage and we have to get away from this consumer consumer ideology. We're all producers. Yep. And the minute that we realize that we're all producers, then we can come out of this binary of they own everything and we're just the people to go get it from them. And yeah. I think I think it's an ideological shift that we have to really focus on. So I think we might have time for maybe two questions if you want to come up to the mic, either of these two mics here. Um, so the first two people, that, that's, that's <laughs> the, the question. <laughs> okay. Hey, um, I'm Brennan. I'm a social scientist. I've been part of various ways of uh, help, helping in small ways create mm -hmm. this uh, apparatus of surveillance capitalism, now so-called, for a decade or so. And I'm wondering, why are we talking about data? Why not just autonomy? Because really what it's threatening is, right, it's data extraction, then data processing, and then the third part of that cycle is pushing some subset of people to do, to vote, to buy what somebody who's willing to pay wants, right? So I, mean, I, I don't know why we're talking about data. Uh, Can I tell it you seems why? kind of <laughs> indirect. Uh, the thing that is being derived from data is I autonomy. think it's about the mechanism with which you change how a system works. So, so data yeah. is just the resource yeah. that we're leveraging to build a better ecosystem that, that sure in fact gives you some autonomy right. or more than you would have in this, uh, in this current era of, of surveillance and, and prodding, right? Or, or that pushes you one way or the other, like that should be illegal, but we can't establish that. Uh, we can't establish anything That's until- the ascendant model of global capitalism. Like, I'm a capitalist. And, like and, and moving people to do what you want, given what you know about them. No, that is not. Is absolutely capital is just capital. A, it's just a thing that you can own. You can Google capitalism and you can theorize and editorialize around a lot of things that it is and is not, but it is actually not of social or political structure at we, all. We disagree on sure. that. We, we, disagree. we disagree. <laughs> yeah. we, we can all disagree, but uh, regardless of how esoteric you want to get about how we liberate people, we still have to acknowledge that in a closed system, which we all exist in uh, many overlapping ones at once, um, that we have to identify incentives of sorts to ensure that we decentralize and marketize our participation, or else we're just going to fall into some other system where we have uh, some someone reigning supreme without competing uh, ideologies. Did you have an answer? Sure, to no, that? no. I would just Dig say in. these days. I would just say these days we um, we need capital at this point because we've not done better yet. But um, you can't separate capitalism from racism. And I think that that's the, the I think that as loving as, as we I'm might be, you, yeah. I think a lot of times we can't, um, we don't get to the root of how destructive capitalism is because we keep having like this class, it's just a class conversation. And sure. there's so much racism entrenched in how capitalism has even evolved that doesn't get, dealt with. And so I think, um, and that's why we're talking about data because the um, there's a lot of community members who are being leveraged in a very violent way because of their race, because of their identity. And it's particularly significant in Detroit. I, I totally agree. I think, yeah, I think the world owes us a, a little bit more, but you really can't decouple those because at one point black people were capital. At this point, you all are capital. No, yeah, no, they still are. I think you know we the, the coolest Massive piece of capital, but 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 you all are all included in this now. I, I, I had a white guy in Tennessee mm -hmm. talk to me about reparations in front of a crowd of two hundred and shocked the hell out of the whole crowd. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, worth trillions of dollars. Exactly. The, so the forty acres and a mule. So it's the reason that we're talking about the mechanism with which we can assign ownership to and move things. I'm sorry, we don't want to yeah, hijack no, you. Yeah, I mean, I, so I've just been told to the stage editor, if you have, we have yeah, to end this panel, but if you have questions, you can definitely talk to them in the hallway. But I want to thank you so much. Thank you. For everything we've shared up here. And thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
you got, so you're from New York. Okay, let's do, thank yeah. you. Yeah, oh, this, really this is great. on? I mean,